Welcome and aloha. I am Mark Schlav, the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today we're going across the sea with three Hawaii lawyers. All three of my guests have extensive experience and exceptional expertise in the representation of international clients, especially from Asia, including Korea, Japan, and China. My guests are Amanda Chang, Christine Kubota, and Kai Wong. Amanda Chang is of counsel to Clay Chapman, Iwamura Police, and Nervell. Amanda practices in the area of immigration law and is very active in the Korean community. Christine Kubota is a director of Damon Key Leong Kupchak Hastert. Christine practices in the firm's corporate, commercial, and real estate law practice groups, primarily with Japanese speaking clients. Kai Wong is a partner at Carl Smith Ball. Kai leads the firm's transactional practice group and its Greater China, China practice group. Kai's practice focuses on the areas of real estate, land use, hospitality, and foreign investment in real estate in Hawaii. All three of my guests have legal expertise. However, they also have an intimate and personal insight and knowledge of the culture, circumstances, and goals of their clients and the international communities that they represent. We all know we're living in unusual times. I've asked my guests to share their knowledge and insights with us about their clients, Asia, the international practice of law, and they've graciously agreed to do so. I'm going to ask each of them questions, and I hope these questions will open up opportunities for other discussion, further, longer discussions. Right now, my first question to Amanda, and I'll ask the rest of you also. Thank you for being here, first of all. Thank you, all of you, for being here. Uh, my first question, what is the biggest issue raised by your international clients over the past year? Amanda. Um, thanks so much for having me here. Um, you know, last year is a very unusual time. So it's kind of hard to carve out what was the most difficult um, in 2020. But I would say COVID-19 um, stopped basically most of the travelers coming from Korea to Hawaii, sp specifically because the quarantine requirement required by Hawaii is extensive. 14 days, now to 10 days, but in Korea, also 14 days when they return. So if somebody were to come to Korea, uh, from Korea to Hawaii, they will just be quarantined for one month in both countries. So it kind of halted. So that kind of changed the landscape of uh, business uh, as usual between Korea and uh, Hawaii here. But one thing I can just say is we have so many investors coming from Korea, buying up and developing, uh, for example, I can just tell you maybe Kapiolani Residence, Sky Alamoana, uh, Alamoana Central. And now there is a, the park at Kiamoku is coming, coming up on Kiamoku near uh, Rycroft and Leona, that whole super block we used to call it. So still the very, very um, investment friendly and then Korea is very much interested in Hawaii and even though they couldn't come physically, uh, a lot of tourists, the business are still ongoing. Ah, that's, that is interesting and also hopeful. Um, Christine, yes. what's your insight? Well, um, I uh, ditto what Amanda just said about the travel restrictions. Um, there is a restriction in Japan that you have to be quarantined for two weeks once you get back. So it's very difficult to have a quick one day meeting. Um, so it's really stopped um, a lot of the travel. Um, another thing is they don't understand how things are here in Waikiki. I mean, at the early beginning, like from March all the way through maybe September, even a little bit now, Waikiki was like a ghost town. It was very difficult yeah. for me to explain to my clients that it's really, really, you know, um, bad here um, and that the hotels were closed. Um, the big issues that I had were landlord tenant issues um, and now mm. P issues, uh, whether foreigners can apply or not apply. Um, I did a lot of um, estate plan issues um, because people were afraid of what was going to happen. 
So those were like the three primary areas during the last year. And, you know, Kai, I want to ask you, but I, I, I'm starting to hear that, that there's still work. And, and so, Kai, what, what, are your, what, what, are your, uh, what are the issues raised by your international clients over the past year? Sure, Mark. Uh, it's very good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm going to make a quick correction. Um, I'm the head of our China practice group, but I'm a member of our transactional practice group. Anyhow, okay. um, I, um, I concur with uh, what Amanda and Chris said so far, um, but my perspective uh, is slightly different in terms uh, of, you know, my I can roughly divide the I mean, it's really difficult, Mark, to single out a single most sort of, you know, important issue. So I can give you a spectrum of issues. Um, one category would be pandemic related, the other would be non-pandemic related. Non-pandemic related, you know, from time to time, because of my um, vast uh, sort of uh, uh, network, in, in China and in Hong Kong, Singapore, um, I uh, entertain you know, inquiries uh, um, about uh, patent prosecution, uh, wealth management, estate planning. Um, you know, China just uh, became the largest uh, producer of patentable innovation and inventions back in 2019. So there are a lot of needs for uh, apl application for patents in, in the US. Of course, you know, my firm doesn't do it, unfortunately. I have to refer them out. Regarding sort of, you know, uh, pandemic related, uh, it really depends on, um, you know, the client's uh, sort of first stage in their uh, investing into the US. Um, for clients who are still in China, they are asking, I mean, you know, as early as uh, in late November, when Biden had, a, so there's a signs that Biden's gonna win, I started receiving inquiries from China, looking for bargain deals, you know, in YKK, you know, high in hotels. Unfortunately, there hasn't been any good bargains. So, but you know, if a client has made a substantial investment into Hawaii, um, unsurprisingly, you know, they are sort of a little bit financially strained because of uh, what's going on, you know, because because of the pandemic, as well as China's um, restrictions for um, capital flow. So they're just like local companies. Uh, and, you know, I echo what Chris was saying. I had several eviction summary possession proceedings, uh, you know, representing mostly um, landlords. Um, also there, you know, for uh, exporters of uh, PPE, um, protective equipment out of China, they are having disputes, so, you know, handling a few disputes, uh, payment delays, uh, uh, you know, shipment delays. So. You know, this is quite interesting because uh, what I'm hearing from all of you is that despite the COVID-19 pandemic, you, you're still busy. You're still yes. doing a lot of work. Things are still going on. And in fact, the COVID-19 has maybe created some more opportunities. Um, I, want, kind of, I, want to, I want to follow up kind of on a an issue I'm gonna ask Christine first. You know, uh, Kai mentioned that her clients were talking about the uh, election and what is, what is the current relationship between the United States and the Asian countries where your clients come from? This is a question for all of you, but I'll start with Christine. Well, what, Japan and the what, US has always had a very good relationship. I don't think anything has changed because of COVID or anything. Um, um, I think if anything, it, they're relying on each other more. So I'm not really worried about that. I think, um, I hate to say this, but the Trump, the change from Trump to Biden administration, I think is helping. Um, we had a really hard time. And I think Amanda will agree with me that, you know, the immigration, the visa issues, they were, they were very, very difficult. Um, usually the turnaround, for example, would be six, you know, six months. It was then become one year. I mean, but I, hopefully things will change um, because of the new administration. Um, Japan, for COVID purposes, is having a hard time with the vaccine. Um, they just approved it. The first shipment came in. They're a little late, um, and that doesn't help the Hawaii-Japan uh, relationship. I mean, the faster they can come here with their vaccines, the better it will be for the economy. Um, 
we, I have no issues with respect to the relationship between the two countries. I, I don't, and Hawaii is especially, we're very, very, very close to Japan. Um, and so I have no problems um, with that aspect. Well, that's, that's good to hear. Now, Kai, I'll, I'll ask you next. And I know that there's been some China issues. So what, what, where, where are we at? <laughs> right. Um, Unfortunately, I cannot say the same as uh, what uh, Chris just shared. Um, so especially under the Trump administration, um, you know, um, the tension right between these two countries uh, followed with you know, political tension and trade war um, had really hit bottom, I would say. Um, fortunately, um, under the Biden administration, uh, we have already seen positive changes. So. Um, so in terms of the uh, relationship dynamics, uh, I do see two forces at work uh, coming from, you know, my clients or uh, prospective clients. So um, on the one hand, um, you know, Chinese are not naive. They, uh, they realize regardless who's in the White House, um, the end game, the objective is going to be the same which is to contain China, to slow down China's trajectory to become the world's number one economy. Um, based on some predictions, you know, since there are a lot of you know, research institution think tanks, uh, they actually, they're projecting that uh, China's economy by dollar terms uh, uh, will be overtaking the US in seven years. So wow. five years earlier, that's gonna happen in 2028. Of course, we're talking about not, not, not per capita, so um, from that standpoint, uh, they say that um, the only difference perhaps is the Biden administration will, will do it in a more subtle way. Um, so knowing that uh, um, there's gonna be caution, I mean, extreme caution among the Chinese investment community uh, to avoid uh, uh, investment risks. Because you know they're still wait and see now. It's still too early to see, right? Even though there are some changes, uh, but it's uh, it's hard. So they're trying to, now to. There's a huge cash surplus in China. It's like amazing because you know they just become the number one FDI destination last year um, in the entire world. So they have a great flows of capital inflow. That creates, in turn, creates uh, um, cash surplus. Uh, so this money, how how do you channel this money? So most, uh, some of the more cautious uh, investors, they try to bypass the U.S. Instead, they're going to other continents. So, so you know that's one sort of more cautious approach. But uh, on the other hand, you know, if the U.S. remains. Uh, the best, most attractive investment destination. I mean, look at the stock market. It's like amazing. You know, look at all this uh, um, growth. Uh, uh, the best, uh, you know, stock market in the world. So, the, the Chinese, uh, from a purely economic standpoint, they don't want to miss out. So they're still looking for opportunities. Try to navigate, you know, between these two countries. So hopefully, you know, there's going to be some uh, relaxation. So that sounds like they're wait. They're gonna. They're they're waiting and seeing. Uh, Amanda, what what is your point of view from your clients? You know, I focus uh, on immigration as my expertise, and I think Korea and U.S. relationship has been really solid and very friendly. Um, started in the mid 1940s, and now since then. It's always been continuously, regardless of the administrations in the U.S. or in Korea, Korea and U.S. have been great partners and trading as well as the political as, uh, and international issues. Korea and U.S. are very solid in terms of, you know, friendship and partnership. And last year and this year, I would say uh, Chris kind of pointed out a little bit about some immigration issues being kind of hectic and difficult but I think it has, has to do more with the pandemic lockdown and physical um, embassies closing down for a specific amount of time eliminates all the visa interviews and whatnot. And, and that made it very difficult, not just the uh, pandemic related uh, lockdown or uh, quarantine. So visa issuance was kind of halted uh, due to the closure of the embassies. And 
the administration of Trump um, kind of halting all um, immigrant visas coming from anywhere, saying that we don't want to have foreign nationals, not just from Korea, from anywhere, everywhere, coming to the U.S. as permanent residents and taking up our employment in the U.S. when we are already hurting. So he basically halted all the immigrant visa and even non-immigrant visa issues, as I said a little earlier, physical lockdown and then delay in scheduling interviews and whatnot change the uh, number of uh, not only immigrants, but also non-immigrant visa uh, issuance has, have uh, gone down dramatically as a result of the pandemic, more so than I would say the administration, um, you know, different presidents have different policies, but I think the pandemic has a, a great impact in the uh, uh, immigration uh, arena. And so it sounds again now like, uh, Japan and Korea, sounds like we're okay. Uh, mm -hmm. And things are feeling a little better, actually, under the new administration. Uh, and uh, China is still wait and see. They're a little cautious because they feel there's competition. And um, they, they want to be uh, uh, concerned. They don't want to just uh, give up. They, they want to be number one and that's where they're going and and so that's kind of sounds that we're we're okay we're okay the relationships are okay uh and that's good i mean what i'm hearing from all of you is actually kind of hopeful uh, <laughs> uh under the circumstances which makes me feel feel good I, I i i you know from your client's perspective and uh from what you're saying um you know we've gone through a, a weird time and now i want to ask a question about the weird time and the COVID-19 and what each of your country's clients have done. Uh, and Kai, start with you, Kai. Um, you know, we've been facing the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, what have your country's clients and your clients' countries done with respect <laughs> to COVID-19? <laughs> um, and what you learn from it? Sure. I mean, you know, uh, it really depends on the location of a particular client. Um, you know, um, I have like conglomerate clients. So, so they have a presence in the US as well as, you know, their headquarters are back at home. Um, so because of the uh, different measures, uh, the uh, different government put in place uh, um, in facing the um, pandemic, I, I believe Asian countries as a whole um, have done a marvelous job at uh, uh, managing, you know, effectively managing the pandemic. Uh, and in China actually doesn't really get the credit, it, it, you know, it, it's that, that's due, but that's fine. China bashing is uh, so um, prevalent. Uh, um, but they, um, I mean, a lot of the figures uh, tell the story. You know, back in uh, the first quarter of uh, 2020, they suffered a great deal because it's, you know, the China experience uh, turns out to be truly informative for, for me, for us, right? You know, back in the um, sort of first half of uh, 2020, I've been in uh, close communications with my friends in high places, you know, back in China. And uh, they they all telling me, oh my God, you know, this thing is gonna, gonna be so destructive to the economy. Uh, quite true, you know, first quarter, second quarter, huge dip. But then because of the draconian measures the government put in place, very strict quarantine um, process, testing, 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 and tracing, and, you know, just better control. So in the third quarter, their GDP growth uh, uh, grew by the rate went up by 6.5%. So for the entire year 2020 as a whole, their GDP growth reached 2.3%, uh, whereas the rest of the uh, world was negative. So yes. when I was talking to, because of my um, background in the hospitality industry, which is the hardest to hate industry, I mean, just look at our hotels in Waikiki, but in uh, third quarter last year, when I was talking to my friends, you no know, leaders in all the international chains back in back in China, they were like, "Hey, you know what, Kai? Um, we are going to beat uh, our 2019's performance." So it's uh, that that's China. But you know, for my clients in the U.S., uh, like I said, they are they are you know having a difficult time, you know, due to financial uh, strains and delays. Uh, 
so we're just waiting, you know, they're just trying to cut down on costs and uh, try to uh, find ways to recover. Okay, Amanda, uh, what are your clients, countries doing with respect to COVID-19? What can we learn? You know, um, my clients um, or Korean um, visit, uh, visitors and investors or people in general, uh, they really like uh, the U.S. as uh, allies, as I said a little earlier. In fact, that's just reminded me. In Korea, uh, the, the way they address uh, the U.S. is called mi guk. Mi guk is a Korean word for the United States of America. If you uh, see the characters they use, mi is beauty or beautiful. Guk is a country. So they even show in the name they call America as a beautiful country. So I think it's in spite of this very difficult times, I think uh, Korean um, attitudes or uh, investment uh, or thoughts towards the U.S. really didn't change much. Uh, we have always been friends, my um, uh, Korea and the U.S. And one thing that um, I also want to share that maybe hopefully we can also learn in the U.S., uh, looking at Koreans' uh, way of dealing with the pandemic is that Koreans have a um, very, they are, you know, they obey. I want to use the word obey, but I'm not sure whether that is a politically correct word. But when <laughs> government says, okay, lockdown, they do listen. When they say wear masks everywhere, they <laughs> listen. They said don't gather uh, beyond four people. Right now, I think their minimum, uh, maximum number of gathering is four. Uh, so they listen, and then they also are very good at disinfecting everything everywhere: public roads, stations, uh, trains, and. Um, subways and so they're really good at disinfecting everywhere as well as listening to what government has to say and lately what however there's one thing that kind of disturbed me um, somebody was telling me about the way Korean government watches um, foreign nationals or anybody for that matter it doesn't have to be foreign nationals but anybody who's returning from foreign country getting into Korea they have a 14-day lockdown uh, self-quarantine they ask people surrounding these uh, um, traveler if they um, um, come out of their uh, quarter, living quarter or hotel where they're supposed to be quarantining themselves. Mm -hmm. The person who report to the police or the government agency gets a uh, hundred bucks per, per uh, report. So oh. I thought that sounds like. Wow, that's amazingly, I don't know, I was really disturbed by the thought of people watching their friends and relatives and neighbors per se. I mean, who would you know if you don't know them, right? So I really thought that was kind of interesting way Korean government is kind of being too restrictive or strict with uh, uh, dealing with the pandemic at this point. Christine, where, what, are you, what are your thoughts? Well, um uh, most of them, 99% of people I spoke to, they want to come to Hawaii. They want to come, they want to come, they want to come, but they cannot, they cannot. So every time I talk to them, is says, I wonder if we can go in March. I wonder if we can go in August. I wonder if we can go in October. I mean, and uh, we can't go either. So, you know, Americans cannot travel to Japan unless you have a visa. And it's um, the consulate has told me that it has to be very special. Usually they issued it here, but now they're issuing it based um, on uh, Japan. Um, uh, direction. So it's going to be a lot harder. So uh, somebody has to be dying or you have to go to a funeral or something like that. And so the, that, that communication gap is really, is very disturbing for me because, you know, it's very frustrating. The Japanese though, um, they don't have police power like we do. And so they can only ask, they can only ask, please wear your mask. Please do this. Please do that. Please stay home. Um, it's almost very similar to the state government and the federal government, but they have prefectural governments and then they have the national government. And so they're all kind of like bucking each other. They're saying, you know, who's going to pay for all of this cost, this, this, this. So that seems to be like the running thing on the news every day. But um, as I said earlier, at least they're coming in with the vaccine. Um, they're going to be um, vaccinating the doctors, the frontline workers first, and then people over 65. But there's just millions of people over there. So I don't know how that's going to work out. But from the news, it looks like they're going to take reservations, blah, blah, blah. So that's helpful. Um, but 
between us and Japan, I mean, they really, really want to come here. A lot of investors have condos here. They have to pay. They have to clean up. They have to do certain things. They're worried about the real property tax. They're worried about, you know, they can sell if it's still a good investment, or if tenants are going to pay. I mean, those kinds of things are just constant. Um, one more good thing is that the stock market went up a lot yesterday in Japan. Um, based on their outlook that things are going to get better. So we will hope and pray that things will get better. Okay. Uh, and a lot of what I hear from you, too, it seems maybe cultural, too. Some of the uh, cultural and governmental impacts. Now, we have a, about three minutes left. <laughs> and I'd, I'd like to ask you each to take a minute. And starting with Christine... What have you learned about life and the practice of law during these strange days from your experience with your clients and in international law? Um, I think it boils down to human behavior. Um, law can only, justice can only go so far. I mean, it's just uh, human behavior. COVID, I think, is teaching us to work together. Um, and to come up with innovative new ideas. I mean, I think lawyers hopefully will always be needed, but um, it's really, really human behavior. And I think we're learning a lot from this corona. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting, the international Im impact and your uh, things that you've said. Too, right, Mark? I mean, you know, it's creating an opportunity for things that we never even thought of, you know, things right. that we thought we could do. I mean, you know, so I think hopefully we'll bring the world together closer. Kai. Oh, sure. Um, I have like uh, several reflections. And, you know, number one, I feel so uh, grateful that we are leaving Hawaii. As my friends telling me, uh, there are much worse places to get stuck at than Hawaii. So number two, I echo what Chris was just alluding to. Um, you know, I'm a true believer of for every crisis, there lies an opportunity. And, uh, you know, looking back now, um, this pandemic had somehow become the catalyst for technological advancement. I mean, look at us today, you know, we can have this uh, show um, via Zoom. And, you know, we're talking about deliveries, you know, people are now use online app and, you know, draw delivery. And for some restaurants in China, they are using artificial intelligence, ro robots actually working in the kitchen and, you know, serving dishes. So, you know, that is just a, whatever you say, you know, the paradigm shift uh, advancement, it's just amazing. For that reason, I think, you know, as a whole human race, we are going to emerge from this pandemic for the better. In I terms like of... Sorry, Mark, in terms of legal practice, uh, you know, habits can change. I enjoy so much working from home, remote, you know, working from home. Uh, Amanda, finish us off. What, what, are, what are your thoughts? You know, one thing I learned is how small this world is, really. You know, you have a one virus happening at one place, and just within minutes, I don't, I don't want to say within days, just within minutes or days, we have it at another places popping out. So we are in this together, whether you are in Hawaii or in South Africa, wherever you are. And law is law. It will, we will still be there after this pandemic is all over, but we all got to care for each other. And as Kai said, there's always an opportunity uh, whenever there's a crisis. It's like one door closes and you have another door opening and you always make the most out of what you have. And even under this uh, pandemic, there are people who are more um, profitable or successful and caring for family. There are a lot of things that's good coming out of this pandemic. So instead of looking at the gloomy part of it, I would say look forward and then do most and do best as, as we can under this pandemic. You know, I, I, I really appreciate your positive thoughts from all of you. They're, they're, those are great. And there's things that I think we are truly we've learned. Um, so Amanda Chang, Christine Kubota, Kai Wong, thank you all for being here today and uh, being on this virtual program. And uh, I look forward to our further discussions on all of these things. But very hopeful, very promising, and good things to learn from from the practice of law, especially international law and dealing with your clients. So aloha to all of you. Thank you for having us. Thank you.